Okay, so we have Judy. Well, hello. Check. And we've got Richard. Welcome to the Richard and Judy Book Club. Check. We have a collection of fine authors. Hello. Check. Hello. Check. Hello. Check. Hi, bonjour. Check. Hello. Check. Hello. Check. Hi. Check. Hello. Check. Which means the only thing missing is you. Come on. The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith, is right here waiting for you. We've got a sequel for you coming up next on the Richard and Judy Book Club. If you liked No Time for Goodbye, I think you'll love No Safe House. Yep, we're talking to Linwood Barclay about the follow-up to his 2008 smash hit. Well, I loved No Time for Goodbye, which we featured on the Richard and Judy Book Club years ago. Now, Linwood Barclay has come up with a sequel, if you like. He's taken the same family, um, Terry and his wife Cynthia and their daughter Grace, and he's kind of put them in yet another horrific situation. <laughs> in No Time for Goodbye, of course, um, Cynthia woke up one day and found that her entire family had disappeared. Yep. And the whole book is finding out what happened to them. Um, and eventually they did, and, and their baby daughter Grace was in terrible, terrible um, uh, danger but anyway it all ended okay and now he takes the whole family again and puts them in another incredibly nasty place in their hometown. Grace is now 14, their adolescent daughter. Mm -hmm. She's very wayward, uh, as typical of adolescence. Uh, she thinks her mother is massively over overprotective and of course Cynthia is because she knows what happened to her. I mean she nearly died uh, seven years ago when uh, when No Time for Goodbye was written. So she keeps her daughter under virtually under lock and key and there's a massive family row about that. Well, you can't blame her, though, can you, after what happened? I mean, I think any, any mother would respond in that way. But what I liked about the book is that the tension just never lets up. No. You know, it hits the ground running. Mm -hmm. and, and as a reading experience, I mean, each chapter just sort of bleeds, if that's the right word, into the next one. Um, expressly, I mean, you, you, you do not catch your breath with his, his writing. No, there's a terrific opening scene whereby uh, an elderly couple uh, who are living in, in, in Terry and <coughs> Cynthia's hometown um, perfectly happy elderly couple are a bit fed up because the students who live next door are playing their music far too loud so they decide to go and complain about it so they go out the house they go and knock on the door students are great oh ever so sorry blah 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 yes of course we'll switch it down they go back to the house next door and in the meantime a completely strange couple has taken over their living room a man and a woman sitting there waiting for them to come back and when they come back this man and a woman these strangers say to them where is it Tell us where it is. And don't say you don't know where it is. There is no other answer but to tell us where it is. And if you say... What is it? What, then we'll kill you. Then we'll kill you. And of course, they do say what is it, and, and they kill. both get killed. And that's how it starts. And it's a completely... People being bumped off all the time to find out this strange, strange secret that isn't money that you might think is something completely different. Travelling and want to take some great reads with you? Download all the titles in the Richard and Judy Book Club to your Kobo e-reader from whsmith.co.uk. Well, Linwood is currently at home in Canada, but that's not going to stop us from catching up with him. Hello, Linwood. It's lovely to talk to you properly because although we had No Time for Goodbye, a very successful novel, No Time for Goodbye, in our uh, in our book club years ago, we never actually got to meet, did we? No, we didn't, and that's too bad. In fact, I didn't even get over there uh, until I guess the September or so. I was over for something, and so I kind of missed even the hoopla about it, uh, and the and the poster. I missed the posters in the tube and that kind of thing. But uh, but it would. But I I did manage to. I did get a copy of the of the show when you folks had uh, had discussed the book. And uh, so it was, I mean, it was just almost as big a thrill just being over here, you know. Oh. Well, it's great, to, it's great to have you back on the list again. Um, and we must talk immediately about the Archer family, who, of course, um, were at the centre of all the drama and all the bloodletting in the first one. Um, what have you got against them? I mean, why, why are they <laughs> suffering so, so badly again? I know, I would, I, they're very annoyed with me. Um, <laughs> I, just, I don't know, I just like it when bad things happen to good people. Uh, so... <laughs> It just, it, and you know, it, the thing is, it was interesting to go back to them because the kind of books that I've been doing with the standalone thrillers, those are, those events are the kinds of things that are so traumatic that 
only one event like that could happen to a family. So you don't sort of go back to them every year and think, well, now I think they'll have them trapped in an avalanche or I'll have them do this or I'll have them chased by crocodiles or something. I mean, you can only do so much to one family. But there had been enough time, mm-hmm. you know, that I felt and I felt there was a kind of symmetry to it because the the daughter in the in the first novel was now the same age as Cynthia Ar- yeah. Archer was when her family disappeared. So I thought there was this kind of symmetry going on that would work. And uh, so it'd be fun to come back to them. Also, I wanted to, to explore the sort of idea that um, just because a thriller ends with everybody getting the answers and supposedly all, you know, all kumbaya, the things that had happened to them would be so traumatic that there wouldn't be this sort of cliche of closure, that they would still be haunted by what happened, even when they know they had all the answers. So that was the other thing I, I wanted to have some, you know, have a look at. I love I, I love Grace. Um, and she is a nightmare, um, an absolute nightmare of a, of a teenage daughter. We've been there. I don't know if you have. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no comment. We'll take no that. Comment, as you. No. Um, but I mean, the, the fact is, I think her relationship with her mother, with Cynthia, is very believable. And it is Cynthia, isn't it, who is so terrified for Grace, uh, prophetically, quite accurately, actually. She's so terrified as she sees the way Grace uh, is, is behaving. And yet she absents herself from the family because she even she feels that as a mother, she's just going too far. Yeah, I I think so. I think she does finally realize that because I and I sort of mentioned this in the novel that it's kind of this this law of unintended consequence. The more you set out to achieve one thing, you achieve the opposite. And so by being so protective, by being so controlling, it just made Grace want to break out even more to get be you know, out from under the the, uh, the her mom's kind of smothering instinct. Hmm. So I think when a couple, those couple of incidents happen, when there's, you know, she gets burned in the kitchen and so forth, I think that's when, when Cynthia realizes that she's, that she's not achieving her goal, that, <laughs> that it's, it's having the, the opposite effect. And, uh, yeah. and she decides, I just need to, I need to give everybody some space. I need to move out for a while. How, how do you find? How do you find as a writer um, getting into the the mind space, the head space of psychotics and psychopaths? I mean, your opening, the opening of the book um, is very, very violent, and it involves two people who are, they have the dead eyes of sharks, you know, and they, they take human life uh, of no account at all. I, I, I had a similar sort of opening to my second novel. It involved a, psych, a psychotic episode, and I did worry afterwards that I found it quite, quite fun to write. Do you, do you worry that you're, you're so fluent in the thoughts and deeds of these appalling monsters? I, now, now that you mention it, um, perhaps I should be. <laughs> no, no, you're not. You, you know, it's just, it's funny. It's just, you know, it's, I, I don't overthink these things. And, and, uh, and as you know, you guys are, you've worked in newspapers, you've been, you're journalists, you know, it's a job and, and you sort of sit down and you write these things and you get going on them and then you just, and you just do it. You don't, over, don't overthink it. At least I don't. And and uh, it's funny, a friend of mine, David Hewson, uh, you know, a thriller writer in over there, um, someone had asked him once, well, how do you how do you uh, uh, write a grisly, horrible scene and then go have lunch? And I thought, I know the answer to that question. It's you write this grisly, horrible scene, then you go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you, mentioned, you, you mentioned the the shared journalistic background. How, lo- how long were you a journalist for? Well, I, my first real, you know, job at 22, I got a job at the Peterborough Examiner in Peterborough, Ontario, mm-hmm. where Robertson Davies had once worked, ah. but was the publisher, but had left. But, uh, I worked there a couple of years. I was in a small paper, a small suburban paper, and then I went to the Toronto Star in 1981. So I was worked in journalism for more than 30 years. Mm. I, I was a couple from 1993 until 2007, 2008. I was a, a humor columnist for the Toronto Star, three pieces a week. And that was the job that I uh, left to write books full time. And when you made that decision, uh, and it's such a fateful decision for so many people because it doesn't always work. You know, they, they give up the day job, they turn their back on security, and, and it, it just doesn't work for them. Uh, it clearly did massively for you. Did it feel like a risk when you did it, or did you know deep in your core that this was, this was what you were born to do? Well, you guys helped a little bit with that decision um, <laughs> because, you know, No Time for Goodbye was such a huge hit, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, and that, that kind of got 
you know, after that attention for that book, I mean, then we were selling the books in France and Germany. Well, actually, we sold it in Germany first, but but I'm a total, so you know, financial weenie conservative <laughs> scaredy cat. So I wasn't going to quit. Uh, my, I mean, I had a dental plan, you know, like who quits a job with a dental plan? <laughs> so, so I wasn't, I wasn't going to do it. So I thought, well, but once I could see that the books were not going to, I didn't want, I wasn't going to quit the star until the books made me not the same as the star, but multiples of that salary. I had to know that I was really secure before I could do it. I mean, I had written, I wrote five novels while I was still working at the Toronto Star. I had the No Time for Goodbye was the fifth. Hmm. And, um, you know, I'd done four sort of funny thrillers that have yet not yet come out in the UK. And so uh, that was I had to know that I was in really good shape before I would take that kind of jump. Well, look, it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you, even though we're doing it uh, by the vagaries of Skype. And uh, when you do come to the UK or if we're over there, we really must meet up for a drink. That'd be lovely. I think we get on very well. Um, <laughs> Well, the book, is, the book is No Safe House, as we said, by Linwood Barclay. If you do get it from W.H. Smith here in the UK, uh, you get all the extra content in the back that is only exclusive to the books in the book club if you buy them at W.H. Smith. Uh, there'll be a Q&A that we do with Linwood Online, which uh, goes into other areas than we've covered here. Uh, there's, uh, there's author's inspiration notes, all kinds of things that you only get if you get it from W.H. Smith. So uh, it kind of makes sense. Um, and enjoy your summer read. We guarantee you will this one. From the Richard and Judy Book Club, I am reading Elizabeth is Missing at the moment. Um, I'm halfway, th- well, I'm getting halfway through the book at the moment, and it's brilliant, to be honest with you. I wasn't really quite sure what to expect, because a lot of people told me about the story, um, and I thought, oh, that's not for me, it's not really sort of my age range or anything like that. Um, and so I picked it up, on because uh, so many people had said, you must read it, you must read it. Um, started reading it, and it's fascinating, really. Well, I read all sorts, really, to be honest. I mean, I've, I've read anything from... I mean, I've, I would take John Steinbeck on holiday because I like that kind of book. I like anything about America, about California in particular. Um, but there again, I like spy books as well. So, to be honest, I'm willing to try anything new. And actually, that's why I come to a book club because it makes me read books I wouldn't normally choose. My favourite summer read ever is Captain Corelli's Mandolin um, because... The film, sorry, is just rubbish. And the book is so good. And the ending is what you want from a book. Um, And you watch the film and you think, well, that's not the right ending. You need to read the book. It's pretty interesting to know or to think that people are out there talking about your book, you know, bringing their own issues to it, having their own take on it. Because once you've written it, once it's out there... It's not really yours anymore. It's theirs to read and to look at, you know, to, to interpret. And what's particularly interesting is that people bring something to every book, to things that you can't imagine. It's when you find out that your book has touched someone in a way that you might never have guessed or never have expected. And, and a lot of times, too, in book clubs and, and uh, when people read your, when you read your novel, they may have an interpretation of it that you never intended, that you might, in fact, totally disagree with. But that's kind of okay. That's part of what this is all about. Well, for me, when, I, when I'm writing a book, what I need before I begin is I need some kind of a hook. I need a way in. I need a what if. Like, what if your daughter didn't come home one night? Or what if the mail got delivered to the wrong house? Or... You know, what if you went to pick up your daughter or your son or whatever at work one day and they weren't there and you found out that she had never worked there? I mean, it's finding these kind of what ifs. And when I have a what if that I think has a lot of potential that can be spun into a 100,000 word novel, then I start figuring out, well, what brought us to this point? What, what set of circumstances brought us to the point where this particular event happened? And once I have that, I start figuring out, I try to figure out the overall book, where where I, where I begin, where I'm going to end up, who are my, my main characters are. But I'm not able to plan out an entire novel before I get, begin because I don't see the potentials or, and the other opportunities that exist in a novel until I get into it. And uh, so that's part of the fun of it, really. And when I am writing, I aim for a couple of thousand words a day. I start at about 8, 30 or 9 in the morning and go till 3 or 4. And if you can, you know, maintain 2,000 words a day, in a week you've got 10,000 words, and by the time you've got two and a half, three months, you've got yourself a first draft. 
And depending, of course, on how good that first draft is, that will determine how much more time you need to spend on it. I've had first drafts that were very close to the final product and I was very happy with them. And I've had other novels where I spent more time rewriting the book than I did on the original first draft. So it's, you never really quite know how it's going to turn out. But as I often tell people, it still beats working for a living. I tell anybody who wants to be a writer, I mean, there are a couple of basic things. One is, if you really want to be a writer, you're probably writing. Uh, it's, not where, it's not the kind of thing where you think, well, gee, I'd like to be a writer someday. Well, I think that if you are a writer, you're writing, whether it's you know, not necessarily for a large audience, maybe it's just for yourself. You're doing it because you just have to. But the other thing is, if you want to be a writer, you have to be reading. If you're someone who says, well, I'd like to be a writer, but I don't have a lot of time to read then you might be looking at the wrong kind of occupation because it's from reading other authors and lots of different authors that you can learn so much. I read so many different writers it's it's hard to narrow down a favorite. I mean I have a few current favorites um, you know whether it's Stephen King or the science writer Mary Roach who's absolutely hilarious or um, you know there's James Lee Burke there's there's so many people about whose work I'm really really impressed with but probably my all-time favorite writer who had made a tremendous impression on me when I was in my teens and 20s was the crime writer Ross MacDonald who wrote uh, the Lou Archer series of mystery novels in the, between the 50s to the 70s. I don't think any writer has made a greater impression on me than Ross MacDonald. So at last we got to meet Linwood, even though he's thousands of miles away. Ah, the wonders of the internet. I still don't understand how that works, but I'm glad it does. So what's up next time? Hello, my name is Frederik Bachmann, and uh, my book is A Man Called Uwe. To them, Uwe is a real person. And I am someone who documented him wrong. So... They like the character, they like the book, but they still doesn't like me. We'll be talking about the grumpy old man next door. And for once it won't be you, my love. Thank you, my dear. Don't forget, if you buy these books from your local branch of WH Smith, you'll get a special edition with access to added bonus content.